Good afternoon, everybody. Today we're talking about the infectious cycle. We're going to talk about what it is and how we study it, what we can learn from it. And then we'll talk about how we measure viruses and a variety of issues related to that. And then finally, we'll talk about methods that are used in virology that we'll be revisiting frequently in this course. The infectious cycle means, or is a summary phrase that means everything that happens uh, in an infected cell. Starting from the beginning when the viruses enter the cell all the way through the whole process of making new virions and release of those virions from the cell. Now uh, on this slide is shown the infectious cycle of one particular virus, poliovirus. And this happens to be the viruses that, that we work on in my laboratory. Now, this cycle is similar for all the other viruses in that family. So poliovirus is a member of the picornavirus family. And other picornaviruses would have more or less the same infectious cycle, but their details would differ. For example, the first step of the infectious cycle attachment to a host cell receptor that would be different for poliovirus and other members of the picornaviruses like rhinovirus, foot and mouth disease virus, and so on. We divide the cycle into steps only to make it easier for us to study the cycle. Because in an infected cell, everything happens in a continuum. And these steps are illustrated here by red arrows, attachment and entry. The next step shown here is translation. This happens next in a cell infected with poliovirus because the RNA that is released from the capsid is in fact the messenger RNA so it can be directly translated. But other viruses have DNA genomes and DNA as you know cannot be translated. You have to first make messenger RNA. So you can see right away how the infectious cycle can differ just depending on the configuration of the nucleic acid that's in the virion. The next step in this infectious cycle is genome replication. And again, we're making more RNAs. The next step is assembly. And we're making new particles. And then finally, release from the cell. This whole cycle for this virus, poliovirus, is taking place in the cytoplasm. But for many other viruses, the replication has steps that occur in the nucleus. And one of the things that I hope you will learn in the course of, of listening to us talk about viruses is that you can predict where things are going to occur simply knowing the configuration of the nucleic acid in the virion. You can predict the first step once the nucleic acid gets in the cell. You can predict where it's going to go in the cell and where it's going to replicate. All right, so the, the infectious cycle tells us a lot about what goes on in viral replication and it gives us a way to study each step in a logical way. Now, before we continue with our discussion today, it's important to define some terms that will come back over and over again uh, in this course. And they're terms that are not obvious in their meaning. So you, you'll simply have to try and memorize them. And there's just two of them, sus susceptible and permissive. And these refer to cells and their ability to be infected by viruses. A susceptible cell has a functional receptor for a virus. That's all susceptible means. Nothing is implied about what happens beyond the receptor. So in other words, the cell may or may not be able to support viral replication. Remember, the, the virus has to bind to a cell receptor on the cell surface, and then it has to get in and replicate inside the cell. So susceptibility only refers to whether or not there's a receptor on the cell surface. And if a cell is resistant to virus replication, that's because it has no receptor. It may be able to support replication internally. And we can, we'll talk later about how to separate those two steps. But resistance refers only to the receptor. Now, the other important term is a permissive cell. A permissive cell has the capacity to replicate virus it may or may not be susceptible. We can separate these two experimentally again. A susceptible and permissive cell is the only cell that can take up a virus particle and allow it to replicate. So again, susceptible refers to having a receptor for the virus. 
permissive or permissivity refers to the ability or the capacity to replicate virus. And as I said, these are not obvious definitions. They're sort of, they're almost arbitrary. You could have reversed them. But this is what we have. We have to memorize these two. And in fact, I'll tell you, many virologists get this wrong. I've seen papers where uh, they mix this up, unfortunately. Now, we, yesterday we discussed that viruses were discovered at the end of the 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, but for the first 40 or 50 years of virology research, these viruses could not be studied in cell cultures. They had to be propagated in animals. And a whole host of animals were used for propagating viruses. Some of them are shown here. Even today, we still use animals to study viruses because we'd like to know uh, how viruses cause disease. And of course, to study disease, you can only answer that question in an animal model. But cell culture has largely supplanted the use of animals for pro growing stocks of viruses, for example, and determining how much virus is present, as we'll see in a moment. There is one animal, one experimental animal, that continues to be used today, and that is the embryonated chicken egg. And that's diagrammed here. This is a very convenient animal because it's delivered in a sterile uh, package, the egg, of course, the egg shell. And within it is an embryo. And uh, many viruses can replicate in the various cells that are part of this animal. So, for example, you can inoculate, vi you drill a hole in the shell, and you can inoculate virus uh, into the allantoic cavity, which is the large one here, into the amniotic cavity, which directly surrounds the embryo, even into the yolk sac, and the viruses will replicate in the various membranes that are present. This isn't used any longer to study virus replication, although you can see here that many different viruses were once inoculated into uh, chicken embryos, or I should say embryonated chicken eggs. But we do use allantoic inoculation of influenza virus even today, particularly to grow uh, the large quantities of influenza vaccine uh, that are needed. And this is done in production, large production facilities where 10 to 12 day embryonated chicken eggs are inoculated by machines. They drill a hole in the egg, they inoculate the virus, they seal the egg, and then they're placed in an incubator uh, for a couple of days. Uh, and then the virus is harvested. You get 5 or 10 mLs of fluid per egg, and uh, that makes about one dose of vaccine. Now, it wasn't until 1949 that it was possible to study virus replication in cultured cells. And this is because John Enders, who is pictured here, and his colleagues Weller and Robbins discovered that they could propagate poliovirus in a human cell culture. In particular, they made primary cultures of embryonic tissues. So you take a piece of tissue, you mince it and digest it with trypsin to make single cells. You plate them on a solid surface, a culture dish, and then you can infect them with poliovirus. So this was incredibly important work. This work led to, for example, the ability of Jonas Salk to make a polio vaccine, which was tested in 1954. And Enders, Weller, and Robbins received the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1954 for this important discovery. And you can see John Enders here on the cover of Time magazine. I believe this was 1961. Medicine gains on viruses. But he wasn't the first virologist on time. Uh, that was Jonas Salk, who in fact uh, was on the cover, I believe, in 1954. A very important cell line used throughout biology, not just virology, is HeLa cells. And these were cells made from a young woman named Henrietta Lacks. Here are the first two letters of her first and last name form the name of this cell line. Uh, she had a cervical tumor. A piece of the tumor was removed in 1951 at Johns Hopkins Hospital. And George Guy, who was a a scientist interested in making cell cultures took a piece of that tumor and found that it made a wonderful cell line that grew forever and ever. It's immortal. And that is because it's a transformed cell line. It has viruses in it uh, that 
has transformed it and enables it to grow indefinitely. And if, if you don't know anything about these cells, you should read this book by Rebecca Skloot, The Mortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. It's a really nice dis description of the whole uh, story from taking the cells from Miss Lacks all the way to the present. We use these cells in our laboratory today, and here's a picture of them on the right. There are a few different kinds of cell lines that are typically used in virus research. HeLa cells and many other cells. Here's an example of a mouse cell line. These are known as continuous cell lines because they will multiply indefinitely. As long as you keep splitting them and feeding them in the laboratory, they will grow. So they are immortal. They are transformed. And we'll talk about what that means in a subsequent lecture. And they're very useful. However, they're not normal. They have abnormal numbers of chromosomes, they are transformed, uh, and so they have limited uses, although they've been used extensively. Another kind of cell line is a primary cell line. Here on the left is a primary human foreskin fibroblast. This is a cell line, a cell culture made from human tissues. So for example, you take some foreskin, you mince it up, make single cells out of it, plate them on a surface and they will form a nice monolayer as shown here and you can passage them you can split the cells and, and passage them 20 or 30 times but eventually they will die uh, only transformed cells such as these 3t3s or HeLa cells will grow indefinitely so these are continuous cell lines compared to the primary cells we also have what are called diploid cell strains uh, these are cell strains that will grow in the laboratory for longer than a primary cell will, perhaps a hundred divisions, uh, but they have normal numbers of chromosomes, so they're, that's why they're called diploid, compared with the HeLa and the 3T3 cells. And these are typically, these diploid t cell strains are typically more preferable for growing vaccines than are um, continuous cell lines. In fact, we don't use continuous cell lines to grow vaccines for the most part. In the laboratory, these cell lines are grown in plastic dishes of all sorts, different sizes and configurations, individual dishes, and multi-well dishes, flasks, and they're grown at 37 degrees in an incubator that has an atmosphere of 5% carbon dioxide, which buffers the medium and keeps the pH around 7. In our lab, and in some others, uh, cells can be grown in spinner cultures, and this is a way to grow a large volume of cells and what is done is a glass bottle is used to house the cells. It has within it a glass rod from which is suspended a spinner bar. This is placed on a magnetic stir plate and the bar moves and circulates the medium so the cells grow in suspension, not attached to a monolayer. This is used to grow large quantities of cells and of course if you want to infect them with viruses you have to put them on a monolayer. In my lab we use lots and lots of monolayers of cells and so um, we use spinners to provide these big quantities. It's more convenient than using uh, plastic dishes. So when you have cells and you infect them with viruses, how do you know your virus is replicating in them? Well, one way is when the virus makes visible effects on the cells, and these are called cytopathic effects, or CPE. And here is a series of photographs of a monolayer of cells which have been infected with poliovirus, and you can see the progression of cytopathic effect here. On the upper left is an uninfected monolayer. You can see uh, cells right next to each other, healthy looking. And then after a few hours of infection, you see some cells are beginning to round up. Uh, by later an infection on the lower left, the cells have detached from the monolayer for the most part. And then finally, 12 hours later, uh, so the cells are beginning to lice as well. So those are three different kinds of cytopathic effects, rounding up, detachment from the monolayer, and lysis. So that's one kind of cytopath, three kinds of cytopathic effects right here, and there are many other kinds uh, that other viruses induce in cells. Another kind of cytopathic effect is the formation of syncytia. A syncytium is simply a giant cell with many nuclei that has arisen as a result of other cells fusing together. Now in many virus infected cells, uh, 
The infected cells display on their surfaces viral glycoproteins that have the ability to fuse membranes. So this cell on the upper left is infected with a virus and it will fuse with a neighboring cell forming a syncytium with two nuclei and then that will go on and fuse with other cells and so then you have this giant cell with many many nuclei called a syncytium. <clears throat> on the lower panel you see a photograph of a syncytium with the arrow next to it and you can just about see the many nuclei in, in the center of that cell. So that's another form of uh, cytopathic effect caused by very specific viruses. Here's a list of some of the other cytopathic effects that are known to occur when viruses infect animal cells. There are a variety of morphological alterations, nuclear shrinking, proliferation of the nuclear membrane, vacuoles, syncytium formation, which we showed, rounding up and detachment of cultured cells, and on the right are all the different viruses known to carry out each kind of CPE. And also on the bottom left, another kind of CPE is the formation of inclusion bodies. Uh, these are particulate structures within the cell, either in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm. They can represent virions or subviral assemblies. And you can see negri bodies, for example, virions in the cytoplasm. This is very typical of cells infected with rabies virus. So if you have someone who is suspected to have rabies and you have cells from that individual that have negri bodies in them, that's a good, it's very likely that that, that person has rabies.